So good morning. Um, I want to start actually by t uh, referring, uh, answering one of the questions that was raised in the last talk, uh, uh, because someone had asked about this low point, the quadrupole. So let me just remind you what we're plotting here. What you're seeing here are measurements of the amplitude of the power spectrum versus multiple moment. And the black line here is our theoretical expectation. The points are observations here drawn from four different experiments. And I'll return a bit to this theme later in the talk. One of the things you should know about the current status of the experimental data is that the experimental data is rather consistent. Different experiments see the same sky, which is reassuring. The theory is mostly consistent with the data, though we'll talk about uh, two intriguing discrepancies today. Um, but there is this interesting point. The value of the quadrupole, the amplitude of fluctuations on the largest angular scales, um, is low. And it's low in a way that's not completely inconsistent with the data. And that's because of cosmic variance. The theory doesn't predict the amplitude of fluctuations. It predicts the variance in the power spectrum. It says, if you have many realizations of the field, what do you expect for the amplitude of fluctuations? What's, what should be the amplitude of that multiple? When you get out to L of 1500 and you measure 3,000 independent multiples, you know, you get to average over 3,000 realizations, you expect the value to be th this cosmic variance scatter is quite small. When we get to L equals 2, we really only get to measure five independent multiples. And because we have to remove the effects of the galaxy, um, and the galactic disk actually looks like one of the multiples, we really only get to measure four independent multiples. So we get four measurements. We're drawing from a Gaussian distribution. We expect a value of around 1,000 microkelvin squared. We observe a value of about 200. Now that happens about one time in 20, one time in 30. It depends exactly how you ask the question. So it's not, doesn't rule out the model, but it is intriguing on the largest scales. And I wanted to begin with a plot that I've stared at for about five, 15 years and still don't know whether it's significant or not. And that comes from, instead of working in spherical harmonics, so just let me remind you of how this goes. Um, we usually take the temperature function, temperature on the sky, expand it out in spherical harmonics. The C sub L's that I plotted The theoretical one is the expectation of the ALMs. Can everyone see this, by the way? So, okay. The observed value, you take the observations, sum over M, and you just get the measured value. So that's, that's what you saw on the plot before. That's hard to see? Uh, let's see. Can everyone see if I write here? Or should I pull out the board? Okay. So, the C sub L's is the expectation of the ALMs. Where I've taken the temperature and expanded it out in spherical harmonics. Uh, 
another way of looking at things, instead of looking in Fourier space, you can look at real space and ask what's the correlation function at some separation on the sky, some separation cos theta, where we take pairs of points separated by angle cos theta. So go to every pair of points separated by a given angle, measure the correlation function. This is just effectively the harmonic transform of the other one. In fact, C of cos theta is some C sub L PL cos theta times, if I remember my constants, 2L plus 1 over 4 pi, and where P sub L is Legendre polynomial. So I can, this is just another way of representing it. And what's intriguing, you take the data, compute the correlation function, here's what the correlation function looks like. It basically goes to zero at around 60 degrees and just stays there. And this is the same thing in the Planck data, where again, you see the correlation function just sits flat right at zero over this huge range of angles. There is basically no correlation between fluctuations beyond about 50 degrees. And if you ask what does the theory predict, that's the black line here. It predicts there should be an anti-correlation here and some correlation there. This is the one sigma contour. <laughs> point by point, these are highly correlated points. It doesn't deviate that much. This is another way of you know, expressing the fact sorry, that when I go to the data, that most of these points lie well within the expected range but they do happen to line up in just the right way Then, when you take the Legendre transform, the correlation function zero. And this was clearly seen in the WMAP data. You see the same pattern in the Planck data. And this is either a statistical fluke um, or pointing to something really profound about the origin of fluctuations that we don't understand. And since most of my talk is, and most of these lectures are going to be about pointing out how everything fits together, um, I do think it's important to, to talk about um, what are some of the potential oddities in the data. Um, we have a tendency as scientists over time Sometimes once, you know, we're at this period of time where sort of a standard model is being established to sometimes forget about some of the discrepancies. And since, you know, when I was a student, none of these things were known. The, the Lambda CDM was not an established model. But you guys are being educated at a time at which this is now an established model. And that's why I think it's important um, to not, uh, push under the rug um, some of these funny features at large scales. The other one that gets some discussion is um, what's called a hemispheric asymmetry. This is a map of the sky. Um, it's the W map and Planck data look identical at large scales effectively. So it's whatever showed up in W map you see us get in Planck. Um, on, there's these funny large scale features and if you look at the amplitude of fluctuations in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, 
I just smooth the sky and measure the amplitude north and south, there's about a 10% difference north to south. This is about a three sigma discrepancy. Um, my own view is it's very likely, this one in particular is very likely just a statistical fluctuation because it was completely a posteriori. You go look at your data and look at oddities. Um, usually, if in physics, if we have some three sigma discrepancy, we get mildly excited and then say, good, let's go get more data. The problem we have in cosmology when we study the largest scales is this is all the data we get on microwave background temperature. We've observed the whole sky. There's, we can't repeat the experiment and expect to see anything different. This is the sky we see. We could decrease the error bars on the measurements, but that's pretty unimportant. Those, those error bars are relatively unimportant. The, at this level, the errors on the map is, are, are tiny. The source of uncertainty is cosmic variance here because our theory is actually not, doesn't predict the amplitude, it just predicts the variance. So making, um, and the cosmic variance errors are, law, are variance uncertainties, they're not errors, they're uncertainties are much, much larger than our experimental error, so we can't do a better experiment. So this, these discrepancies are, um, potentially f interesting physics. At a minimum, it's an interesting uh, place to be, I think, philosophically, because we're at a place where we've actually reached, in some ways, the limits of our ability to measure the universe. Right? We can only see fluctuations within our causal horizon. Yeah? If you could observe the fluctuations in the neutrino background, you'd have another shot at this. We also have some more additional information potentially from polarization measurements. Um, and we have some more information potentially um, for measurements of the large scale distribution of galaxies. If we can probe, um, galaxies do not probe out to the volume of the microwave background, but if you looked at say the large scale distribution of quasars at redshift six, that had, would have the potential to probe on these scales. So there are a handful of things we couldn't, we can get a few more looks at these largest scales. Right now, all those things are um, difficult to do experimentally. Looking at large scale, looking at these very largest scales in galaxies and quasar surveys were limited somewhat by uh, the quality of our photometry and the uh, effects of dust. Uh, we hope that sort of the next generation large scale structure experiments, particularly the space-based ones like uh, Euclid and W first might make some progress on that. Um, fluctuations in the neutrino background I think are in the long run very interesting, but uh, you know, we will li not likely have neutrino background fluctuation measurements in the next five years. But you know, hopefully, uh, you know, uh, well, detection. Hopefully, hopefully, in your careers, I'm not betting on mine yet. I'm 56, so you know. Yeah. There's a couple different things to do. It's actually a, it's a hard question to ask as a, uh, without having alternative models, right? So you can, if you construct an alternative model, you can measure the relative likelihood between the two models. That's really what you'd like to do. But there aren't, um, if I can write down an a posteriori model that's designed to fit it that's not very physically well motivated, and then it'll be more likely. Um, you can, um, the simplest way to ask it, the question is, um, I can predict, say for the quadrupole, um, what's the probability, I can ask the question, what's the probability of measuring a quadrupole smaller than 200 microkelvin? 
and that's a couple percent. So it's a, a number that's intriguing, but it's not a part in 10 to the 10. It's not something that's so far out in the tail that you would say rules out the model. And what I, um, one of the reasons, um, you'll find that sometimes people quote slightly higher numbers in the literature when they claim to find these discrepancies, but they tend to, you know, for example, looking at this hemispheric discrepancy, they'll tend to choose an angular scale that maximizes the signal and then ask how likely that is. And since you had no theoretical prior on what the scale is, I think that tends to, that does tend to overestimate it. There's a, effectively a look elsewhere effect. So if you then ask the question, let me look over all possible scales, how often, and all possible orientations, how often do I see this? Then it usually ends, it, 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 those things end up being less significant. Yes. So you have, I mean, the lambda CDM model is, ver is predictive. It tells you for a Gaussian random field what you expect. And, you know, when you've got something like that and you see one of these discrepancies, um, people tend to hunt for the discrepancies and you have to be uh, careful of assessing its statistical significance. Um, I think they're worth talking about because if someone comes up with, what you'd like to have is someone come up with an alternative theoretical model that fits that data and makes other predictions. That's the way you'd like things to advance. Um, an example of an alternative model that does a better job of fitting that correlation function is if you assume that the universe is finite. If you assume that we live in a three torus and the size of the three torus is comparable to the visible universe, then that means you're missing modes on large angular scales because you don't have modes on scales larger than the three torus. That suppresses the quadrupole. So I can write down that model, it will fit the data better, but that, partic or that part fit the correlation function better. But if we lived in a three torus, then when I look at that part of the sky, and that part of the sky, I should see similar patterns. And in fact, you could quantify that pretty well. It was in a three, to um, remember, when we're looking at the microwave background, we're looking at a sphere around us. And if that sphere is embedded in a three torus, then when we look over there along a circle in the sky where the three torus intersects the sphere, the surface of last scatter, and I look over there at a circle where it intersects the three torus, then I would see the same patterns in both directions. And we've looked for that and we don't see it. And in fact, you can look at all possible patterns of circles and any, regardless of the underlying topology, so regardless of what the, fun, the shape of the fundamental domain is, the surface of last scatter is a sphere when the, your, your fundamental domain crosses the sphere, you'll get a circle. So for any topology, you'd get pairs of circles. We've searched all possible circles. We don't find any matches beyond what you expect from random. And based on that, we can actually say that the, um, size of the fundamental domain uh, of uh, if the universe is finite is at least um, 80 some odd gigaparsecs. So our universe is, is very big, basically as big if not bigger than the surface of last scatter. Once you said it's that big, it no longer explains the quadrupole being low. So that's an example. It's what I'm fond of having worked on it, that you look at this you propose something that could explain some of these oddities. You test it and it fails. But, you know, that's, uh, there, may, there are certainly other hypotheses. All right, so let me now turn from large angular scale temperature 
to measurements of the microwave background polarization. So remember when an electron comes in in Thomson scattering, if you have an electron come in where the E field's pointing this way, it's more likely to scatter to you like this. An electron comes in with the, sorry, sorry, photon comes in with scattering off an electron with the E field pointing this way, it'll scatter to you like this. So in this polarization, you tend to see photons, imagine I'm an electron, that come in this way and scatter towards you. And in this polarization, you see photons that come in this way and scatter towards you. So when we look at the surface of last scatter and we measure it in polarization, we're basically measuring the quadrupole moment of the photon distribution measured at each point on the sphere. Right? So you're seeing in one polarization, let's If I'm looking at the surface of last scatter, I've got a hot region here, a hot region here, a cold one here, and a cold one here. I'll have more photons that come in this way and scatter to me with the polarization vector pointing this way. So I'll tend to measure the polarization vector on the sky is related to the pattern of temperature fluctuations. So I can look at the sky and I'll see at each point polarized emission. And the microwave background on small scales is actually quite polarized. The Polarization fractions about 17 percent. So it, it's as our experiments become more sensitive, we can make pretty accurate polarization measurements. And what we do is we can take this pattern of polarization and we can decompose it into patterns that are symmetric among mirror reflection. These are gradient-like, and we call these E-mode polarization fluctuations. And those that are anti-symmetric under mirror reflection, and we call these B-mode fluctuations. V variations in density scalar fluctuations produce only E-mode-like fluctuations at the surface of last scatter. Vector and tensor modes produce both E and B modes. And we'll come back to this in the final lecture because one of the very intriguing things that we're looking for right now in observations of the microwave background are, you know, we're looking for uh, B modes produced by gravitational waves in the early universe. And those gravitational waves produce both modes, but since scalar fluctuations, which are the dominant form, produce only these, if we see B modes and they're cosmological, that would potentially be the signature of gravitational waves, and that will, that's something we'll talk about in lecture three. Um, we can also just look at the patterns this way, and this is again showing here's a pattern of uh, hot and cold spots. This is a single wave, and you can see the E mode pattern is symmetric under mirror reflection, and the, the B mode pattern is anti symmetric. When we look at the E mode fluctuations from uh, scalar fluctuations, we tend to be picking up two different things. On the very largest angular scales, scales of, say, 10 degrees or bigger, we're seeing fluctuations from photons that were produced at the surface of last scatter at redshift of 1,000 travel to us. At redshift 10, star formation has re-ionized the universe. 
So remember, the universe is ionized beyond redshift of 1,000. Electrons and protons combine to make hydrogen. The universe is neutral for a long time. A couple hundred million years after the Big Bang, star formation starts up. The universe becomes dense enough to form galaxies. Once star formation proceeds, it reionizes the universe. And photons can scatter off of these electrons and produce a large-scale polarization signal. In fact, we turn this around, and one of the ways in which we study the universe at redshift 10 is by measuring the large-scale polarization signal that gives us an estimate of when the universe was ionized. On smaller scales, what we're seeing is something more like what I described here, that the polarization signal is generated by variations in temperature. The dominant source of those variations in temperature are actually gradients in the velocity field. So this, these photons are hotter here because the electrons are moving in this direction, and that produces a Doppler-like effect that boosts the photons. talked about that. So now we can go back to these patterns, and you can see if we've got a cold spot around a hot ring, if I'm out here with the hot ring and I'm sitting at this point here, I will tend to have more, hot, things will be hotter in this direction than this direction, and that lines up the polarization. So I get this polarized pattern of the polarization pointing kind of in a circle on these scales and outward on these scales around each uh, hot and cold spot. And I'll have the reverse pattern. So here's the pattern around the cold spot. I have the reverse pattern around the hot spot. Yep. The scale here is always about one degree, and that's the angular scale subtended uh, by these acoustic fluctuations. What sets that scale, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, is remember we have the sound wave moving out, moves out for 380,000 years, so it's about, it's moving at about half the speed of light, so the radius, uh, so the diameter of that circle is about 380,000 light years. Um, you then have to correct for the expansion of the universe, which makes it bigger by a factor of 1,000. So that corresponds to about a, 100 megaparsecs. And, and then w that ruler is the acoustic scale that we can then measure the angle of, and that gives us the distance to the surface of last scatter. So that, that's what we see when we look at that degree scale. The fact that we measure both temperature and polarization is actually very useful for checking the nature of the fluctuations. So this is what I went through over there, uh, just the expansion. I want to do that because we're going to look at the nature of fluctuations. So what do we learn from studying the fluctuations? And this is something uh, uh, people ask me about after lecture, so I want to say a few words about here. One, and here I think the polarization fluctuations are very important, is we learn what's the nature of the fluctuations. Are they uh, fluctuations in uh, density of the universe from place to place, or are they fluctuations in the composition of the universe from place to place? These adiabatic density fluctuations mean we have the same ratio of, say, dark matter to photons or baryons to photons everywhere. But what varies is the, is the overall density. So the universe has uniform composition. That makes a particular prediction for the pattern of temperature fluctuations and polarization fluctuations. And again, these plots are just, you should think of them as nothing more than harmonic transforms 
of those pictures I showed you, where you've got those uh, peaks in the temperature spectrum uh, that correspond to those features from the acoustic fluctuations. And you can see when you Fourier transform the polarization fluctuations, the peak positions are shifted relative to the temperature fluctuations as those rings line up differently. And here's the cross-correlation between temperature and polarization. And a distinctive feature of any adiabatic fluctuation, as long as you're doing things causally, is that the temperature and polarization um, are anti-correlated on large angular scales. And a lot of that represents the fact that if I'm setting up a pressure wave, so I'm creating a pressure wave by gathering higher density of things here, the velocity vectors point outwards from the density peak. And if your velocity vectors point outwards, that produces an anti-correlation between temperature and polarization. The other possibility that nature could have chosen, oops, go the wrong way. Wait. Oh no, I copied the same slide twice. Okay, the other possibility is the photon and dark matter densities could have been uh, combined to be constant. So you had it could have had a situation where the total density of the universe was constant. Regions that had more photons had less dark matter. Regions that had less dark matter had more photons. This would be an entropy fluctuation. And this could arise if you start out with a, a uniform universe, but the process that determines the abundance of dark matter varies spatially. This, for example, happens at phase transitions, when if you do something like generate Co defects or cosmic strings at a phase transition, then this region has more of one uh, the defect and this has less. And that would produce entropy fluctuations. Entropy fluctuations produce a different pattern in microwave background fluctuations. For entropy fluctuations, the peaks in the temperature are shifted by a, about uh, pi over two in phase. So the peaks all shift over in the top plot, and the temperature and polarization fluctuations are correlated on large angular scales rather than anticorrelated. If I start out with things being uniform and I want to create a density fluctuation, I have to gather material inwards, right? And then the velocity fluctuations are correlated or point towards the density peaks rather than away from it. So one of the first things we learn when we look at the pattern of temperature and polarization fluctuations is by measuring their phases that tells us that the fluctuations are primarily adiabatic. And um, here we go with the fluctuations. Now we're actually looking at the data from the TE and EE fluctuations. And what's nice in this self-consistency test here is this comes from the Planck 2015 paper, where what they did was they took their temperature measurements, they fit the best fit cosmological model, and then predicted, knowing what you see in temperature, what the pattern should be in polarization. And this is the so the red line here is not fit to the data. It's fit to the temperature temperature data. And then you predict what the temperature polarization data should do. This again is not fit to the EE data. It's fit to the temperature data. 
and then you predict what the polarization should do. <laughs> and finally, this is the galaxy baryon acoustic oscillation measurements. This is the large scale distribution of galaxies. So what we're doing is we're looking at what the temperature fluctuations look like at redshift of 1100, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And we're predicting what the galaxies um, should be doing in the nearby universe. And it matches quite not very nicely. All the things line up and fit well. And to me, this is just a great, well, triumph certainly of experiment, because a lot of work of people to make these accurate measurements, but also a theory. And go back to a classic paper by Sinyaev and Zoldovich in 1970, where they noted that a detailed investigation of the spectrum of fluctuations may in principle lead to an understanding of the nature of initial density fluctuations, since a distinctive periodic dependence of the spectral density of perturbation on wavelength is peculiar to adiabatic perturbations. And we're seeing exactly this nice periodic dependence they predicted. You know, something I mentioned earlier on in this lecture that I think is just important to stress in terms of understanding where we are is in this field is the very nice consistency between the microwave background experiments. You can actually look at this, say, multiple by multiple. This compares in red the cross correlation between WMAP and Planck. In black, the Planck Planck auto sorry, the Planck black is cross correlation, red is auto correlation to Planck. You can see multiple by multiple, they agree very well. When you get to higher multiples, smaller angular scales, the W map maps are noisier than the Planck maps, so the error bars are larger, but the W map values are fluctuating around the better measured Planck values. And on these large scales, the two experiments agree remarkably well. This consistency is true, is there not only when you compare the two space-based missions, but also when you compare ground-based experiments. And here's zooming in on a patch that's about five degrees by three degrees on the sky. This shows the pattern of fluctuation seen by Planck. Above it, the pattern seen by ACT. This is at 143 gigahertz and 217 gigahertz. And you can see up to the levels of the detector noise, the two experiments see a consistent picture of what's going on in the sky. Once you've seen that very consistent picture, you have some confidence looking at this data and trying to extract the basic cosmological parameters. So the first parameter we can sort of read off by eye looking at the fluctuations is the density of baryons. And um, remember that when we look at the microwave background fluctuations, we're seeing sound waves propagate in the early universe. The rate at which those sound waves propagate is going to depend on the composition of the universe. So as we vary the density of baryons, and each of these curves are 10 percent different variations of the density of baryons, they start to deviate from the current best fit model. The more baryons you have, the higher the first peak, the lower the second peak in the microwave sky. It's these measurements that tell us the universe is about 5 percent atoms. What's very nice is we can actually measure the same number, the, the density of baryons, and we like to express it this way as um, omega baryon h squared, where we've defined omega baryon 
have to be equal to the density in baryons over the critical density, what it takes to make the universe flat. And the standard convention is to find little h as the Hubble constant in units of 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Well, we often express our results this way. It turns out that you could just multiply by rho crit. We're actually measuring the density of baryons in the universe in um, kilograms per cubic meter, or whatever unit you prefer. And we've measured that to about 5%. What's very nice is we can measure that to about 10% accuracy. By measuring the abundance of deuterium produced um, left over from the early universe. The early universe starts out, well, let's say it starts out very hot, very dense, but then cools. About a minute after the Big Bang, the universe is a sea of protons and neutrons. The protons and neutrons combine to make deuterium. Once the cosmic background is cool enough, which is about eight minute, uh, three minutes after the Big Bang, that the background no longer dissociates deuterium into protons and neutrons, this reaction freezes out. And then pretty quickly, the deuterium combines to form helium-4. This reaction proceeds until the number density of deuterium times the cross-section times the age of the universe gets less than one, at which point the deuterium can't find each other. That critical deuterium abundance is just going to be one over this combination here. The age of the universe when this decoupling takes place depends on the photon temperature, which depends on the number density of photons. So the deuterium abundance turns out to be depending exactly on the same number, the ratio of baryons to photons. So we can get a very nice consistency check. For me, one of the great moments when I was working on the WMAP experiment was the night before we announced our first results. Um, I got a call from David Teitler, who was uh, at University of San Diego working on the deuterium abundance. And he had much improved measurements that he was going to put out in the following months. His results were far enough along he knew the answer, but he hadn't gotten the paper out. And he called me up and said, I know you guys aren't going to change your results because you have an announcement tomorrow. And I want you to know that we're not changing our results, even though we'll see your measurements tomorrow. I want to give you a copy of our best fit parameters, and you have the numbers. And he emailed me his measurements. And they agreed to within one sigma with our measurements of the baryon abundance. And for me, this is one of the great tests we have of the Big Bang Theory, because when we look at the microwave background, our, we're measuring the baryon abundance by physical conditions 300,000 years after the Big Bang, and we're looking at how sound waves behave. When we look at the deuterium abundance, we're looking at nuclear physics um, three minutes after the Big Bang. And they agree. The fact that they agree actually tells us a lot about the, cons um, the laws of physics not changing over time. So if the strength of gravity was 10% stronger three minutes after the Big Bang, that would change the relationship between time and temperature. That would be off. If, you know, the deuterium cross-section depends on the, you know, the strength of the strong interaction, you know, 
in strong interaction, it depends on the strength of electromagnetism. So if you change alpha by a few percent, or change the strength of the strong interaction, or change the proton mass by a few percent, all of that would lead to a discrepancy here. So this agreement is actually one of the nice tests we have of the basic equations of physics being constant over space and time. The next parameter we can read off is the matter density. And we can either look at that in terms of the shape of the power spectrum or what I showed before and we'll go back to by looking at the pattern so that we see in the microwave sky. And finally, we can read off the angular diameter distance. Uh, Zichi Wang at CETA, part of the ACT team, made a nice plot of this where we looked at the acoustic fluctuations in the ACT data. So this is the same kind of pictures we showed before. Um, these are plotted in radians rather than degrees, but the same, this, is get, this is the pattern of a hot ring around a cold spot in the ACT data before we showed that in the Planck data. This is what we expect from lambda CDM. If we try to get the best fit without dark matter or without dark energy, it looks nothing like the pattern you see. That, you know, usually we express this in terms of trying to fit parameters to the CMB spectrum, but you can really see it by eye that we get consistent sets of parameters. In terms of the actual numbers we measure, pro, uh, these are the current best measurements from Planck, from the combination of WMAP and the ACT experiment. Just, these are completely independent data sets on the microwave sky. Um, you can see that we see a number, a number of interesting numbers. Um, first, in terms of the uh, primordial fluctuations, we, if the spectrum of fluctuations was scale invariant, we would get n equals 1. We see a spectrum that is a little bit redder than n equals 1. Um, we see about a 5 sigma deviation from n equals 1. This is actually what you expect in, infla in most simple inflationary models. We, if the inflaton was higher up on the potential at earlier times, rolling down the hill, when we look at larger angular scales, we're looking at earlier moments of inflation. We expect that the universe is um, expanding more rapidly then. Um, so this is ver what we see in the spectral index is certainly consistent with inflationary models. We have very accurate measurements now of the, the dark matter density and the baryon density with about five times as much dark matter as baryons. And uh, it's been intriguing to me to realize that all, there are many different components of the universe that all have comparable density today. Right, so if we look at the density in dark energy today, it's about five times the density in dark matter. The density in dark matter is about five times the density in baryons. The density in baryons is, you know, about, let's get the exact number, but it's about five to ten times the density in uh, neutrinos, in the most massive neutrino species. There are three neutrino species. There's sort of an order of magnitude between each of them and their contribution to the energy density. And also, you know, the energy density in uh, photons today um, is about one two thousandth the energy density in dark matter, one four hundredth the energy density uh, in baryons, or uh, you know, about uh, 
you know, comparable to the energy density in the lightest neutrino species. So we've got arguably seven components, all of which have the same energy density within a factor of a thousand. And why those end up to, and those are varying with time in different ways, why they all end up to have the same energy density, um, we don't know. You know, we think the physics that sets the dark matter abundance, the baryon abundance, the neutrino mass, is, you know, those parameters are not obviously connected to each other. So may, maybe this is telling us something profound, or maybe it's telling us there are many different stable particles that contribute to the universe, and uh, if you have enough of them, the energy densities all end up being in the same ballpark. I don't know, I've always been, I've been intrigued by those numbers. So that's the baryon and dark matter density. And there, are still there are what? There could be that doesn't make the, you know, the, the baryon abundance is not set by thermalization. The dark matter abundance, well, we don't know, but if it's a wimp-like dark matter, its abundance is not set by thermalization, but by freeze out. Um, the neutrino abundance and the photon abundance being similar is set by thermalization, but the energy density of neutrinos is set effectively by what the neutrino mass is. And that's set, again, by different pieces of physics. Uh, but the baryons, well, f uh, the bar if the baryons were just thermalized and there was no baryogenesis, then we would have t tiny amounts of baryons. So. The final parameter um, I want to talk about is the Hubble constant. Um, and that's because there's a lot of interesting discussion happening right now about what, um, what's what is the best value of the Hubble constant and what's going on with that. Um, I, it doesn't really matter whether the Hubble constant is 67 or 73, but what we would like is experiments to have consistent measurements. And right now we have three or four different ways of accurately measuring the Hubble constant. One which we've talked a lot about is the microwave background. Gives us a value around 67. The second, which we'll come back to and we've talked some about, is using the large scale structure in galaxies or in the gas, the baryon acoustic oscillations. That also gives us a value about 67. And the final techniques are classical astronomical techniques and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but these classical techniques give us values like 73. And in some ways, this looks like a pretty good agreement. Uh, when I was a graduate student, people argued whether the Hubble constant was 50 or 100. So uh, seeing it converge to 67 or 73 is significant progress. But if we believe these error bars, this is not consistent. So what's going on here? Well, first let's talk about what people actually measure. So we've seen how we've measured the microwave background fluctuations, and now we're basically using the angular scale of the hot and cold spot to measure the distance to the surface of last scatter and that gives us an integral measurement of the Hubble constant. Uh, let me remind you that the angular diameter distance is the integral over dz of h of z so the microwave background is giving us this integral measurement we see something similar when we measure the fluctuations in the galaxy distribution. 
This is a plot again of the galaxy correlation function weighted by distance squared versus distance squared. This is the baryon acoustic peak. By measuring its location, I have a ruler. That's the ratio of the sound horizon distance to the angular diameter distance. And using different surveys over a function of redshift, you can measure these distances. The line here is the best fit Planck model, and you can see the baryon acoustic observa oscillation observations are consistent. And what they're measuring, and actually in many ways what's coming into the microwave background positions, is basically, oops, no, I do not want to install Java right now, um, even if there's an update available. <laughs> the, um, what you're measuring when we're looking at those, the baryon acoustic oscillations, or we're looking at the microwave background, is basically a ratio between two numbers. How far a sound wave can move, right? So that's going to depend on the sound speed and what the, we have to include an expansion so that we have to integrate dz over h of z. And we want to integrate that from the begin, whenever we generate the sound wave at very early times to when decoupling took place. So this gives us how far the sound wave can move. The other thing we measure is the angular diameter distance between zero and the redshift where we measure it. And when we look at the um, microwave background fluctuations, we're measuring this at Z decoupling. When we're looking at the galaxy surveys, we're measuring these at much lower redshifts. It's useful to look at these equations because if we're seeing a discrepancy between the Hubble constant we measure at redshift zero and what we infer from observations of microwave background or baryon acoustic oscillations, what it says is we've got to change the behavior of H of Z, and that means changing our assumptions about the evolution of the density of the universe. This again shows the current state of play with the data. Bunch of different microwave background experiments. They all show the same pattern. If you want to be consistent with the CMB observations, you want a value of the Hubble constant, you know, close to 68. The local measurements are giving us values like 72. Uh, they're not really ver consistent with it. How do those local measurements work? Well, there's a whole bunch of different approaches to measure the Hubble constant using a lot of different astronomical techniques. And I put this plot up to show you that while I'm going to focus on one particular approach, there's actually a bunch of different um, ways in which people test things. And the one that I want to focus on here is one that I think in many ways is the cleanest. We begin by measuring parallax distances to stars. Let me remind you how parallax works. We can all do this experiment right now. Hold up your hand like this with your finger up. Come on, this is our one chance to do experiments here. <laughs> close your left eye, close your right eye. You'll notice your finger moves relative to the background. This is the classic way astronomers measure distance. We know the radius of the Earth's orbit, we observe the position of a star in the sky uh, in March and September, and we watch the star move against the background. With the European Gaia experiment, which is now reporting its results, and the gate put out its first results in November, we're now measuring these um, angular displacements 
with accuracies of order 10 micro arc seconds. That gives us accurate distances um, out to scales of about 10 kiloparsecs. So we can now measure distances to stars directly um, throughout most of our galaxy. That lets us measure the distance to a class of stars called Cepheid variables. Cepheid variables uh, have been studied for over 100 years, beginning with, sort of classic, with classic work by Annie Jump Cannon. She showed that these uh, stars are variable stars that have a very straightforward relation between their period, their brightness oscillates with time on periods of, of order a couple months, and their luminosity. So if you measure its period, you know its intrinsic luminosity. We can calibrate this relation by using our astrometric measurements, right? We can use our parallax measurements to get the distance to nearby Cepheids, determine their luminosity, then observe Cepheids in nearby galaxies, and this has been done a lot by the Hubble Space Telescope, and that gives us the distance uh, to those nearby galaxies. That gets us to this local group with the Hubble constant. We then observe supernova explosions in these nearby galaxies. And for supernova, once you measure its light curve, you know its intrinsic luminosity. So we can now calibrate the intrinsic luminosity of supernova and then take the next step in the distance ladder and measure the distance to distant galaxies. And that's the approach that gives us a value of about 73. So what's going on here? There's either some systematic in the classical astronomical techniques, and you know, they've had a hard time achieving the precision of microwave background measurements, so that's certainly possible. Or there's um, some systematic in the microwave background experiments, um, and that's something we best check by making more measurements. What we're doing right now, we get one second, is um, we are making temperature and polarization measurements with higher angular precision with the ACT experiment. We actually have the data in hand now. What we hope to achieve, we're hoping by the end of the year we'll finish our analysis, but things tend to take a little longer, um, is we will have an independent measurement of the Hubble constant using the polarization data um, that will either be 68 or 73 or something else. We're uh, blinding ourselves from it, so I don't know what the number uh, will be. Um, so we'll, we'll check the CMP experiment or new physics. Yeah? How about using BBN? Because presumably that can also probe H naught. Uh, BBN, uh, BBN doesn't really probe. H naught it probes the baryon density. It, BBN gives us a measurement of omega baryon H squared. But it's also sensitive to H. I mean, uh, like, uh, Hubble comes into play inside BBN as well. So the, so the Big Bang nucleus synthesis is sensitive to the Hubble constant at redshift of uh, B, uh, 10 to the 10. But we know how to, how to evolve that until today, right? So we know how to evolve it to today if we knew the composition of the universe. So let me remind you. Um, actually, why don't I uh, raise the board at this point? Can I raise this and switch the blackboard? All right, I'll just use, oh, there we go.
the Hubble constants is equal to a pi g rho times where rho is the sum of the density and all the different components. So this is the density in photons. That's going as a to the minus 4. This is the density in all the relativistic species, anything that's relativistic. So that's going as the number of neutrino species times T neutrino to the 4. So it's going as a to the 4, four minus 4. If the universe, if the standard model is all there is, the n nu is 3. It, the early universe was a wonderful accelerator. So uh, one possibility is that other light particles that we've not yet identified were produced in the early universe if they're, and de they decoupled at an earlier time. If they de did so, they would contribute to n nu. So th theoretically, n nu could be greater than 3. This is the baryon density. That goes as a to the minus 3, as does the matter density. These two abundances we've actually measured pretty well. So this, these pieces, we know how they behave. We've measured the microwave background temperature, so we know this one well. So this is uncertain. And what's also uncertain is the behavior of the dark energy. We often talk about the dark energy's behavior in terms of its equation of state W, where its behavior goes as a to the minus 3 times 1 plus W, where if W is equal to 0, it would be behaving like matter. If W is equal to minus 1, this is a, a vacuum energy or cosmological constant. So this is the equation of state of, of dark energy. Within the context of the things people like to play with, this is not known, and this is not known. So what games people have been playing as ways of explaining what's going on, potentially, is suggesting maybe they're more light neutrino species, or maybe W's differs from 1. Changing the number of light neutrino species also has the effect of changing when we go, undergo the transition from being dominated by radiation to being dominated by matter. And if you recall, when we looked at the transfer function, the transfer function for the dark matter, when is 1 over k squared over k equality squared to the minus 1. If I change this ratio between these guys and these guys, that changes k equality. That changes the amplitude of a large-scale structure. And if I make this go up to, say, 3.4, 3.5, which does help reduce the tension uh, because it changes the way I interpret the microwave background and large-scale structure data because Rd is CSDZ over H of Z. If I change H of Z, this makes it uh, changes Rd and brings the C and B and BAO into a line with the H naught measurements. But if I fix things there, that changes the amplitude of large scale structure and makes the amplitude of galaxy fluctuations no longer consistent with the amplitude we infer from the microwave background. So that changing things that way doesn't seem to uh, help. The other possibility is to change the angular diameter distance, and you need to do that at, early, at relatively late times, right, because the angular diameter distance say for the baryon acoustic oscillations 
just the distance from here to say redshift point 2, that means changing things when the universe is dark energy dominated. If you want to fit the data, you actually end up with W less than minus 1. Um, that's a very funny set of properties for the dark energy. That implies that the energy in the vacuum is growing or with time. Uh, it implies that the universe's rate of acceleration is growing. If this continues, um, the universe accelerates ever faster, eventually accelerates so rapidly you tear apart galaxies, and then every atom, and then every nucleus gets torn apart. This is called the big rip. Um, it's pretty awful in both its theoretical implications for underlying physics, but for our ultimate fate. Um, I was interviewed, I guess, about this by New Scientist around November 1st. What I told them about the big rip was that I viewed it somewhat similar to the Trump presidency as seen from November 1st. Physically possible, frightening to contemplate, but um, not likely to happen. <laughs> um, based on my predictive abilities, I fear that the dark energy may be, the universe may have W less than minus 1. <laughs> However, um, here we actually have some observational data that seems to contradict this because we can make measurements of angular diameter distance or luminosity distance using supernovae. And when you include that data, the values of W you need to solve the discrepancy between um, the observations and theory um, don't seem to fit the data. So we're in an intriguing place uh, with this, uh, these H naught measurements. We don't seem to have an obvious theoretical way of, you know, an obvious way of changing the theory, of having an obvious tweak to the model we have and adding an epicycle that would make these two measurements consistent. Um, I think the next, you know, there's sort of next steps for everyone involved. For theorists, I think we need to think about are there other ways in which we could relax our assumptions of how we interpret the data, ways in which we, you know, things we assume about the evolution of the universe that might make it possible to make these uh, two sets of observations consistent. Um, for the experimentalists working on microwave background, they need to re measure it yet again in different ways. And for people doing uh, classical astronomical tests, um, those need to be checked in various ways for self-consistency. Um, the Gaia results are being released in the series of data releases. The next one will happen in April. When that happens, we'll be able to get direct astrometric measurements to a much larger number of stars. That will hone those measurements. Um, if I had a bet, I would bet at this point that the classical astronomical distance ladder is off by a few percent, and when it's properly calibrated, everything will fit together nicely. But given my previous success at prediction, um, I'm not, I, I wouldn't guarantee that's right. The question there. So, um, when we talk about the error estimates for a given cosmological parameter, we do that in the context of a particular theory. So we say, let's assume three neutrino species and W equals minus one, and then predict what happens. So those, the values you saw had those error bars. The game that people then like to play is, let's relax that and uh, make models 
where I add extra neutrino species. And there are dozens of papers in the literature where people take the data. All the data is public and all the codes are public, so it's actually pretty easy to do the, play this game at home. Um, allow extra neutrino species, allow the Hubble constant to vary, and you'll get an error ellipse to the data that might look like this, that the microwave background data alone, if you add extra neutrino species, allows a bigger value. So you can either quote the error here or here. The problem is, or the good thing is, things are connected. So if this might be my, oops, sorry, combination of combining C and B and Hubble constant measurements, if I then turn around, oh, I'll just, you know, it's easier just to walk here. And look at the amplitude of galaxy fluctuations. versus the number of neutrino species, where sigma 8 is a conventional way to describe the amplitude of galaxy fluctuations. It's actually one well, of these old historic definitions. You draw a sphere of 8 megaparsecs in radius. You look what is the RMS fluctuations in the amplitude of matter within that sphere. It's where it turns about to be the right size to um, get the amplitude of fluctuations on the scale of clusters. So here's our CMB-like prediction. That's the, uh, say, one and two sigma contours. My cluster observations sit around here. They want the amplitude to be lower, given the number of clusters we, we measure and observe. They're kind of consistent with the standard value, but they're already a little low. If you add neut more neutrinos, you make things uh, inconsistent. So this is the, uh, you know, how people relax the model uncertainties. All this assumes that the errors in the experiments are done correctly. And that's why you want to keep checking them with, with multiple experiments. I mean, the, what? Oh, 3.5 is about here, about 0.85, about there. Yep. Yeah. So, I'd be worried. I mean, I've, well, you know, I usually have a strong prior that, you know, based on the null energy condition, you know, that W is greater than minus one. I mean, uh, that's, that's my personal theoretical prior. I'm willing to, you know, consider other models, but you're violating the, you know, you don't like to violate the null energy condition. Right. I mean, you are, I feel one of my jobs as a cosmologist is to work to make sure that these deviations either go away or turn out to be five or six sigma. So, you know, it was, you know, a number of years ago, I think, uh, you know, cosmologists were able to say with some confidence that we think there's dark energy. We think the universe is accelerating. We have pretty convincing evidence for that. Took some work to get there. Our goal now is that I can, you know, walk over to Nadi and say, that null energy condition, forget about it. The universe seems to violate that. That'd be a, something that you, you know, 
I don't want to say that until the data is really compelling. And data isn't compelling yet. I don't think, I don't want anyone to take away that this W is less than minus one. Um, but we do have an interesting moment where, you know, it could easily turn out at this point that these discrepancies go away as the data improves. That's usually what happens. But every now and then, discrepancies get worse and point to new physics. And um, we don't know which way things will go. Yep. I've heard uh, one explanation for the larger bubble constants that we're living in a local dark matter void. Yeah. Yeah, so that explanation, I think, um, can be observationally ruled out. So the idea here is we're at a special place in the universe that we're surround that the density, say going out to maybe redshift point two around us, the mean density here is significantly less than the average density of the universe. So that local measurements of the Hubble constant um, differ from the large scale measurement. You know, there are two reasons to be, uh, worry about this. One's partially theoretical in that you can say, what's the amplitude of fluctuations does this require on these scales? And it's really large, right? It's, you know, order unity or order tenth, a couple tenths of um, fluctuations on scales of a few hundred megaparsecs. And we know what the amplitude of fluctuations are on those scales from measurements of the microwave background and large scale structure. And we would have to be living in a very unusual place in the universe. But you could actually test this more directly by using what's called the Kinetics and Yef Soldovich effect. So if I have a cloud of electrons and I've got some microwave background photon moving through that cloud of electrons towards the observer, that cloud of electrons is moving towards the observer. It'll scatter those photons. And if it's moving towards me, it produces a hot spot. It's a moving mirror. Moving away from me, it produces a cold spot. And the amplitude of that effect goes as the optical depth in that cloud times the velocity. Nature provides us with lots of these clouds of gas. They're called clusters of galaxies. This effect here is called the kinematic Sinyaya-Soldovich effect. Or often written as KSC. There's a second effect called the thermal Sinyaya-Soldovich effect. So here, a photon scatters off hot electrons and gets scattered up in energy and has a change in energy of order KTE over MEC squared times tau. What this does is since it scatters things up in energy, it takes the Planck distribution. Since everyone's scattered up in energy, at low frequencies it produces a cold spot, and high frequencies it produces a hot spot. So at low frequencies, which actually below the peak is where most microwave background observations are made, it actually casts a shadow against the microwave sky proportional to the optical depth. So we can actually measure in this way the optical depth. We know the electron temperature also from X-ray observations. So we me can measure the signal from clusters. 
We can then turn around, if this model were right, relative to the microwave background, all the clusters of galaxies in the nearby universe would be moving relative to the microwave sky. So we should have a very significant KSZ effect if we're living in a local void. And we've looked for it, others have looked for it, we don't see it. So based on that and these normalizations, we can um, rule out the possibility we live in a local void. Significant enough to explain the Hubble constant discrepancy. Yeah. So, supernova are being used in two somewhat related ways for cosmology. When we look at using the um, supernova to calibrate what people call the Hubble diagram, which is the relationship between luminosity, distance, and redshift, or equivalently, get, you, uh, the supernova were first famous for the fact that you have measurements out here at redshifts of a half and greater that were showing deviations from what you expect from a universe that the supernova, let's see, we'll have to plot this as luminosity distance, yeah, were um, systematically dimmer than you'd expect in uh, Einstein de Sitter, omega matter equals one universe. And this is the measurements back in 1997 that, you know, led to the observation of cosmic acceleration, 2011 Nobel Prize. When we're looking at measuring the Hubble constant in the local universe, we're actually relying on observations of supernova here. At ver you know, within the nearby universe, redshifts less than 0.2. This is very recent times. So there's very, it's not likely for supernova evolution to play a significant role. Yep. Uh, I, yeah, I'm actually not familiar with the claim of variation in G, in variation in G dot over G. Uh, Well, you want to change, oops, I guess I've erased it. Yes, you can, if you change G, and I actually don't know, let's see. Right, remember what we're measuring is this, and we're measuring quantities like that. So if you, if you change G, you'll change H of Z. And if you, what we'd like to do to fit the data is make the, um, the value, uh, the density of the universe of the dark energy larger today than in the past. We want that W less than minus one goes the right way. So equivalently, if you made G larger today than in the past, that would go the right way. So. Uh, potentially, yes, that could be the explanation. Uh, I'm actually not at all familiar with any experiment showing it, but it'd be worth thinking through some of the other things that does. Um, if you change G, one of the things that I would check, just thinking of you know, off the top of my head, is remember that grad squared phi is 4 pi g delta rho, where these are the density fluctuations. So if g was changing with time, that changes the gravitational potential with time. Microwave background fluctuations, photons, 
moving through a time-dependent gravitational potential experience, will experience a change in temperature. The thing I would check for, and I have no idea whether this would be, gives an interesting constraint, is this would predict a correlation between temperature fluctuations and density fluctuations due to time variable g. And you could stack on galaxy positions and look for that effect. So that, that would be how I would, one way I would think about checking for it. Um, time variable g does all sorts of fun things. Um, it changes properties of stars, right, because um, a star is basically in a pressure equilibrium between a gravity gradient, gravity making it collapse, and pressure trying to make it expand. So you change the central temperatures of stars, which uh, change the way stars evolve. Uh, so I, it's, it's tricky to vary G. Yeah. No, I, 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 um, so I'll, I'll close actually on that by um, mentioning, if you haven't seen the movie Bull Durham, I strongly recommend it. It's about American baseball, small town. There's a great scene in Bull Durham in which um, the sort of older baseball player uh, who's the catcher is to explaining this young pitcher breaking into the major leagues um, that he needs to know his basic quotes for interviews when he's being interviewed as an athlete uh, uh, by a, rep a reporter. And he's taught phrases like, I'm just happy to be here, I just want to help the team. Right, and all these quotes people say over and over. The quote that I, th I always think of that when I hear questions like this, particularly from the press, when people talk about results, um, they have some claim like time variable g, um, and the re response you get to give as a b being interviewed by the press is, that's important if true. <laughs> all right, so I'll, I'll see you all on Friday. Thanks. <laughs>